All right, YouTube, there is a big article that came out today from the game director, Aaron Keller for Overwatch, and this is his director's take, and he talked a lot about tanks today, their win rates, their perception of it, and he mentioned a little bit of 6v6 here. Sit back and relax, and here we go. Director's take, talking tanks and upcoming hero balance changes, June 28th. Hey everyone, it's been a bit since our last director's take. We've missed a few of these in recent months. Sorry for the gap. Speaking to all of you will continue to be a priority for the team. Let's talk about tanks. Let me rephrase that. A lot of you are talking about tanks and I'd like to contribute from a developer point of view. We've heard from players that the tank role is in a tough spot right now. All right, who agrees with this? Honestly, hot take for me is maybe because I only play quick play tank. I actually enjoy tank and I don't feel like tank is that bad, but maybe it's because I haven't experienced playing it endlessly every season. So my experience is very limited, but I play it here and I like every time I queue it for quick play and I get it, I don't mind. Tank is in a tough spot and has been since season eight ended. We agree. That's not to say that tanks were in a perfect spot before season nine, but the problem now is that most of them just don't feel as tanky as they should. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with this already because I, I feel like tanks are like pretty good in terms of like staying alive in a lot of cases. Anyways, many times both support heroes need to focus solely on the tank to just keep them alive. This depends on the tank you're playing and that's why I kind of mentioned that, but in any case, in this scenario, both the tank and supports can feel like they have limited options in their gameplay as they are essentially tied to each other. Our internal stats show this as well. We've come up with a new metric since season nine that we simply call tankiness. It's roughly the number of deaths a hero experiences compared to how many deaths they ought to experience. There's a lot of stats that go into determining what an expected death is, and I'm not able to go into that level of detail here. The point is your experience and our data are aligned. Hero deaths divided by expected deaths, divided by maybe the average amount of deaths, crease, uh, yeah, and I mean, they obviously can't go into depth, so we can only speculate here, but my assumption is probably some, some number divided by a number to create some ratio using my, you know, failed statistics math brain here. Aaron says, since season nine, almost all heroes in the game have become less tanky. This isn't all unintended. Didn't they add HP? But I guess, the project, the damage didn't go up. I guess DPS passive kind of offsets like 15, 20%. Everybody gained 50 HP. It became easier to hit stuff. Okay, well, this is, I guess this depends on how you look at it. One of the issues we were addressing at the time was the sheer amount of burst damage and healing available. However, most tanks, excluding Ball, who was roughly the same, moved a lot further than heroes in other roles. Recent changes like the headshot damage reduction on tanks had some effect on this, but it's still under where we'd like it to be. We still like many of the game-wide changes that were implemented over the, the last few seasons. The projectile size increase, I agree. Headshot damage and knockback reduction on tanks, I agree, that's also fine. And the passive health regen on all heroes, I agree that was fine too. However, what we're currently discussing is whether the path forward from here should be centered around broad systemic changes or per hero changes. I think we go here. We're discussing limited versions of the former. For instance, we're looking at reduced versions of the damage roll passive. Okay, you can bring it back down to 15% instead of 20. However, we'd like to do more of the latter, which is, yeah, individual hero changes, good. Individual buffs or nerfs to heroes can have a dramatic impact on their effectiveness compared to a broad change that targets all heroes or a role. Additionally, it further reinforces the differences between heroes. For example, one of the reasons Ryan ought to feel tanky is through his shield. So how does this relate to tanks? We're putting together a patch that is targeted at increasing the tankiness of many of these heroes, but we're doing it through individual changes to each of them. Ideally, these changes would build on a hero's fantasy. For example, a cr increasing the health of Ryan's shield is a good example of accomplishing both of those goals. This is a priority for our balance team, and right now we're targeting either mid-season 11 or season 12. We'll have more details on some of the changes to expect and more concrete timing soon. I mean, I don't really think the health of Ryan's shield is like actually anything we need to consider right now. It's more of him closing the gap and being able to do that. I think a shield at 1400 is like one of the best in the game already. The thing that Emong has in the creator card, giving him movement speed with the shield is actually the direction they should go to kind of close that gap. Okay, so this is kind of big. This is kind of big in terms of like increasing uh, patch individual changes to each tank instead of just doing more global tank changes 
where it's just one rule that wraps them all broadly. Each tank, if I had to speculate, is just going to be a bit better at what they do. So I guess their direction for Ryan is more shield, but I don't know if they're nerfing something else to compensate. Maybe for Winston, I mean, I think Alec Dawson teased it in the interview with Spyro. They're doing something with Primal Rage for, for, for Winston to make that a bit more iconic to him. Let's move on. This touches on some of the, the discussions we've been having about balance philosophy in general. Balance in the game is very nuanced and doesn't just depend on the total power level or win rate of the hero. We actually look at pick rate, skill tier, region, and platform, not to mention a myriad of other individual stats like the amount of damage, deaths, and kills heroes have. On top of stats, design goals and community perception also guide some of our decisions. Some of the recent metas have been brought into question uh, the different to into question the different ways we look at balancing heroes that could be considered niche. There are heroes that the community is okay with having both a high win rate and a pick rate. When Reinhardt hits a 60% win rate, which is considered very high for us, yeah, that is a little insane. 60% is crazy, averaged out, and is played often, there are actually few complaints. But when a Roadhog does this, he recently topped out at around 54% win rate, the community reacts differently. There are heroes that the community deems more fair or at least less frustrating than others. The mechanics of some heroes, especially at really high levels uh, of play, require us to pay more attention to them. We still want every hero to be competitively viable, and we love that some of our heroes can be the right situational pick, but we think it's healthier for the game for us to proactively and more in a timely manner manage certain heroes and prevent them from dominating. So on that, that vein, where is the balance? on the first few days of season 11. No standout winner, but D.Va, Sigma, Winston, Junker Queen, Reinhardt, and Zarya are in the upper half and their win rates are between 50 to 55%, okay? With damage, Farah continues to excel at around 58%, Reaper at 55%, and May at 50% have risen, and Sojourn has dramatically fallen to 44% there. They're missing some tanks because they're only mentioning the ones in that winning half. So anything that they didn't mention, I assume are below 50%. Roadhog, Ball, Doomfist, Roadhog, Orisa, etc. Okay, and supports are relatively stable with Ilari being the biggest mover, rising a few percentage points uh, to 55%. That's it for this week. We should have another director's take out in a few weeks time. Until then, have an amazing season 11 and let's make a great game first and foremost these win rates while while he literally says they do a lot when they look at balance pick rate skill tier region uh platform win rate etc this stuff is without context they don't actually say if this is unmirrored mirrored what rank what region if i had to assume if he gave no context to this data Perhaps this is averaged out across all ranks, all regions, all platforms. Diva doesn't surprise me. She got buffed this patch. Sigma doesn't surprise me. Winston doesn't surprise me. Junker Queen does surprise me. Uh, they did buff her this patch with a faster uh, rampage. Rhine doesn't surprise me, believe it or not. Zarya does surprise me, being in the upper half. And it surprises me Roadhog is no longer in the top half. Although the nerf to the take a breather down to 40% and losing 50 HP on the season 11 patch is kind of big, so actually it's fine. And yes, Mauga isn't in here. That's a big one, believe it or not. Farah being crazy is no surprise. Ever since the OWCS in DreamHack about a month ago now, three weeks ago, and they played a shit ton of Farah. Farah just skyrocketed in play rate. With, you know, Sojourn being nerfed this season a lot, right? And people pick a lot less Sojourn. It's not like necessarily like, you know, when you lose a very popular hero played a lot, you have to obviously fill in with a, another slot in the DPS and Farah's, a, you know, a nice, I wouldn't say like complimentary skill wise in terms of like Sojourn players being able to pick up Farah, but like because there's an empty slot that isn't always locked in with Sojourn as much, naturally other DPS pick rates go up and Farah seems to be the clear winner here. Farah is very good once they fig people figured out how to, the, the, the more optimal play style, people have evolved. They saw how the pros play it, very spammy, very pokey. I'm not actually shocked about this. I'm actually shocked that Reaper being 55%, 
But again, if this is all averaged out, I would assume like Reaper is, is you know, dominating lower ranks and he kind of already ha like has been for a long time, no matter what the perception of Reaper is at the high levels. Like Reaper is able to get away with sneaky flanks and tank bust at the lower ranks because he's 300 HP and he's harder to confirm a kill. But then as you climb up, the sneaky style doesn't work as much. Good players know how to sniff that out. So like his role, it's kind of like you have to play a full brawl comp around him. That's not really gonna happen too often solo queue uh, in terms of all five players being in sync. So interesting. Alari is also an interesting one being actually very, very good. I'm surprised Cassidy isn't up there because Cassidy is so incredibly popular. It might kind of grab when, when, you, when a hero is very popular, it naturally gravitates the, the, the win rate closer to 50%, which might be a reason why Reaper is actually pretty high despite his not as popular pick rate like always the niche more niche heroes like sim torb and reaper conventionally have a pretty high win rate if i'm not mistaken my thoughts on the the, the tanks is i'm a little worried because like people still complain about it uh, a lot about tanks but i you know and they're going to do some some they're going to cook and they're going to start like tweaking tanks to like go more into their identity and i'm worried about too much power creep for tanks because i low-key feel like they're actually not that bad right now it's not fun i think the problem therein lies with a lot of people saying you know when a lot of people counter swap to it that's the perception that's what doesn't feel fun for a lot of people when three four people completely you know pick something to deny your fun. They aren't as underpowered as it seems to be, and I think people are mixing up the frustration and, and fun versus like raw power level. But that's where that's why I'm not a he developer and a hero balancer, because you have the balance between player perception, how they feel playing the hero versus their actual like raw power level. So it's tough. Aaron Keller tweeted this today. Spurred a lot of talk around 6v6 because obviously he was talking a lot about tanks. We recognize that this is an important topic for many people, including us, and we would actually like to jump into the conversation to share our POV. Look for more of this in the next director's take or possibly dev, possibly the dev update. And that dev update and stuff should be out in a few weeks time. They will talk about it. Doesn't mean, don't draw to the conclusion that they're gonna bring it back magically. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I'm gonna lean to no, because I'm not trying to dismiss people who love 6v6 and think it will be good for the game. Because like, I, there are pros and cons to both sides. And I'm like, I can't say I, I loved Overwatch as 6v6, but I still really like Overwatch as 5v5 as well. Um, you know, when we, we, we end up trading one problem for another when we keep going there. Yes, it may fix some stuff when we go back if we do try to go to 6v6, but then it may reintroduce old problems and new problems you didn't account for. And then sometimes it feels like could be going backwards in some capacity, but not really. In any case, nostalgia is always short lived. Remember that some people are actually missing the nostalgia per the portion. And uh, once that wears off, it can die off pretty quick. People play it for a bit, but then they like taper off very fast. Cause once you hit that nostalgia, it's like, it doesn't drive anything past like a month or two. It always wears off. In any case, that's my thoughts. I'm curious to hear yours. I'm just a little worried of them uh, tweaking it too much. That's all.